Well, good morning to you guys and to you online. It's great to see you guys and those who will watch this later on to the online people. I just want to continue this week on the theme of prayer. Last week, if you remember, I did look at what do we do when God doesn't make sense and really to keep trusting. This week, I'm going to look at prayer and initially I did say that I wasn't going to tell people how to pray, but I found a key or I found a pattern in the Bible that I think may be encouraging to you guys and also to me as we endeavour to keep on praying and just coming forward. Now, if I said to you guys, you online, you watching, you know, how many people, that, this is a rhetorical question, so don't answer, but how many of us think that we don't pray enough? I would assume that most people would put their hands up. There may be some people online that go, yeah, I do. Because there's always that one in there, that, you know, the super Christian. But then, you know, some people, if, we were, if we're honest, we'd say we don't really pray enough. Yet, if I asked you how many people believe in the power of prayer, probably everybody would say, yes, I do. I believe in the power of prayer. I believe in, in everything that God said. And I believe as we pray, God answers prayers. But to, only, but to be honest with you, sometimes when it comes to praying, for me personally, I tend to get straight to the point with God. Because otherwise, I get kind of distracted. You know, I kind of, I get bored. And sometimes I think God gets bored, at least when I'm praying. You know, just get to a point, and then, then I get bored, and I feel he's bored, and then I feel guilty, and I feel, oh, this is getting a bit of a mess. And it's kind of not the way that prayer is. Prayer def- the definition of prayer is talking to God. There used to be a phrase many centuries ago where I pray you, which meant I speak to you. So in, in, they would, kings would say, I pray you. Just I talk to you. So when we're praying to God, we're talking to God, that's it. Yet, because of certain styles and groups and, and people, individuals, it kind of became a development of, of the elite. And because in centuries gone by, many Christians were very well educated and, and many Christians weren't. The educated ones wanted to let everybody know that they were educated and they would stand and would pray really eloquent prayers. Now, anybody who knows me well, especially those alive, will understand that I'm not that eloquent. I'm just me. And I actually hear God in a Yorkshire accent. Sorry if you're from the South or wherever. But that's just the way I think God speaks. God's own country and all that lot is Yorkshire. But when I speak to God, I tend to keep it quite short. And I spend more time in the bath praying. I love it. Driving. That is when you do need to watch and pray. When you're driving, if you're praying, just don't close your eyes and be really spiritual. But I was intimidated as a young Christian because there were some what I call super Christians. You know, those people that would pray and they'd quote the Bible in their prayers. They'd come out with stuff that I didn't even know was there. They'd quote the Bible. And you said this, Lord, and in Deuteronomy 28, that we'd be blessed coming in and blessed going out and we'd be this and that. I just go, wow, that amazes me. I could never pray like that. And those people used to huff and puff. And you could tell them coming, there was a prayer, well, there's a mighty prayer coming if there's enough and they're puffing. And I'm blowing the answer. And then even better, those who bind the devil. Woo! We'd all go crazy on that one. I bind you, devil. And I bind this and the binding of this and the binding of that. And you just think, wow. And it almost sounded like some people were Moses' little brother. They knew the Bible more than Jesus did. And stuff had come out. <coughs> and in my house group, as a, as a young Christian, this is maybe where my insecurity of prayer come from. And my respect that you had for me, that little bit has probably just gone out of the window now. But I'm being honest. But I was being an ask up and people pray. And they pray like this. They'd sit there and you could tell them, oh, oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Oh Lord. My God. When I just, when I just have awesomeness of your wonder. And Lord, I consider all the works that your hands have made. Lord, I see the stars. Lord, I even hear that mighty thunder. And I see your power throughout, throughout the universe. And I'd be thinking, wow, I'm not worthy. 
they continue. And when I think, God, that your son, your son you didn't spare in, you sent him to die. Lord, I can scarcely take that in. Yeah, on that cross, Lord, my burden gladly bearing. Jesus burned and died to take away my sin. Then sins my soul. I didn't realise they were quoting hymns. I thought their praise was so amazing. And yet I thought I could never be like that. And even better than those people that pray in the King James. I mean, that's got to be spiritual, isn't it? So if you want brownie points with God, you've got to pray in the King James, usually him, quote as many Bible verses as you want. And in all that, I think God goes, what are you doing? Because God often looks for a heart that's humble before him. There's two great mistakes that I feel that people make when praying. Is that our prayers are often too small and our prayers are often too general. Let's face it, we are praying to the creator of the universe, the king of kings and lord of lords. The one that holds us together and holds everything together and we're asking him, Lord, can I have some bus fare because I need to get into town next week. God's going, you know what, if you ask for a car, I could do that. But if you want some bus fare, there you are. It's almost like we're asking for crumbs when there's a full table set before us. We cry out to God for the little and he's going, guys, there's so much more for you. Over the years, I've, I've listened to lots of prayers, and I actually do like listening to people's prayers. So most of this were written at um, the end of last week and beginning of this. So I, I actually put down that I listen to prayers, and over the years, over the prayer meetings that we've had here, the one time I had to slam my Bible down on the floor because things were just getting a little bit silly. Because sometimes you get people who pray competition prayers. Have you ever come across that one? Lord, I pray that I may witness to a, a person this week. And then somebody then cries out from the other side of the prayer meeting, Lord, I pray that I will lead two people to Jesus this week. And then somebody goes, Lord, help me to lead four people and heal them as well. And it's kind of competition builds up. And before you know it, someone's praying that they'll raise the, the cemetery completely to Jesus. And you just wonder, what does God think of all that? Because when we say we love people, we're not, we're not in competition with people. We're there with people. But often over the years, I've heard these prayers, and you may have come across them. These are fantastic prayers. These are great prayers. And you'll hear, listening prayer means you'll hear these all the time. These are amazing. Lord, bless me. And then God goes, uh, have you not read Ephesians 1 verse 3? I've already blessed you. You know, people say, Lord, be with me. God goes, I am. I never leave you forsake you. You know, Lord, help me. Yeah, I've told you I'm going to provide all you need. That's fine. Take it. It's all right. Uh, this is a, a controversial one, but people need to read Colossians um, 1 verse 13. Lord, forgive us. And he goes, yeah, I did. On the cross 2,000 years ago. We've just done the table. It's all past tense. Another one, I love this one. And I've heard people preach on this. And I've heard people pray, Lord, come down. And he goes, I did. And then I went back up and I sent my spirit. And the same spirit that raised me from the dead lives in you. Amen. And people cry out, Lord, come down. But one of the amazing ones is, we need to pray till the brass heavens open. And God's going, what brass heavens? I'm here with you. Um, you don't have to shout up, you can pray, talk to me. See, sometimes our prayers are way too small and our prayers are way too general. You see, general prayers do not move God to specific action. So if you can't pray a prayer which is going to have a result where you can glorify him, I think sometimes that's an insult to God. That we pray so small and so general, because we're edging us back. Lord, give me a job. God goes, yeah, okay, no, no problem. What job do you want? Just give me a job. And what job do you want? McDonald's? Burger King? CEO of a great company? What job do you want? 
And it's kind of like we, we need to engage in prayer. General prayers do not move God to specific action. Martin Luther, if you don't know him, he's one of the fathers of the Reformation in the 1500s. And he had a, Fred, a friend called Frederick Myconius. Myconius. It's an interesting name, isn't it? But he had a friend called Frederick Myconius. And Frederick wrote to Martin Luther and said, Look, mate, thanks for all you've done, but I'm dying. I'm on my way out, but I just say thank you to you, but I'm going. Farewell, ta ti ta, see you in heaven. So Martin Luther wrote back. Now this is a prayer. This is a prayer. Martin Luther wrote back to this guy who was on his deathbed dying. And he said, I command you in the name of God to live. Yes, get excited. I command you in the name of God to, get to live because I still need you. Remember the word because? He makes a statement and then he adds the why. Because I still need you in the work of reforming the church. The Lord will never let me hear about you, your death, or that you die, but will permit you to serve me. For this I am praying, because I seek only the glory of God, uh, glory in the name of God. My conium went on, you know, he got the letter and he couldn't even speak because he was that far gone. And he's laid on his deathbed and he read the letter and went, okay, got out of bed. And carried on living. And actually he died four months, sorry, two months after Martin Luther died, years later. That's a prayer. And they are prayers that move God to action. I remember a boy on Joe um, praying for a bike. Years ago he, he talks about him praying for a bike. And God said, yeah, I'll give you a bike. What colour do you want? And he was like, uh, I didn't really know you could ask for a colour. You know, when my kids ask for summer, they don't generalise it. Lord, uh, Dad, can you just give us something for Christmas? They're kind of a bit more on the target. And they're kind of int, but I've told them men don't take int, so women do, but men don't. You know, you can int as long as you want with me. Just tell me. And I think God's like that, just say it as it is. So this guy, he died after Martin Luther and Martin went on to doing a great thing. So I'm getting to the prayer now that I wanted, and it's in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, but before we get there, I noticed in the prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, certain words that is so that. So I went and looked at different prayers that Paul came out with, and found out there's five prayers that Paul prayed that have so that in it. This is in the NIV. So, looking at Paul's prayers, five prayers, he says this, I keep, this is Ephesians 1 verse 17, which we had on Wednesday night as well. He says, I keep asking, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gracious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. He prays and says, so that you'll do this or have this or know this. So he makes a statement and then he puts the word so that or a junction phrase so that this happens. We often say, God, do this and that's it. But Paul often said something so that this will happen. And then let's look at Philemon chapter, well, it's verses 4 to 6. He says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. I pray, says Paul, that you may be active in sharing your faith. That's a good thing, isn't it? Be active in it. So that... You may have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. Witnessing leads to having a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. According to Paul, it does at least. So that we may have a full understanding. In Philippians, it says this, this is 1 verses 9 to 10. And that in my prayers, sorry, and this is my prayer, that, you look, that your love may abound more and more in the knowledge and depth of insight, so that... We've got a common thing going on here. So that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Jesus Christ. So he often preaches or he's praying, he says something so that this happens. Yet we don't often pray like that. We just pray, God give me, God do this, God do that. Instead of saying, God, could this, could, I'm going to pray this so that this happens. I'm praying for a car so that I can get to that amazing job you're going to give me. 
I'm praying for a blessing in this area so I can be a blessing to other people. I'm praying for this so that this can happen. In Romans 15, verse 5 to 6, we read this. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same uh, attitude of mind towards you, uh, to each other that, uh, that Christ Jesus had. So that, with one mind and one voice, you may glorify God the Father uh, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, may you have endurance and encouragement be given to you and have the same attitude that Christ had, so that with one mind and with one voice we may glorify the Father. Everything he says is, so that. So then that brings us to number five prayer in Ephesians. But let me just tell you, Jesus did the same. This may surprise you. Jesus did the same. Jesus says this in um, John 17. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, but my prayer is also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you guys. Because he was talking about his disciples, but his disciples then went and, and did some preaching and got more disciples, and they preached and got more disciples, and through the generations it came to us, and now we are followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, through the people that's witnessed to us. So this is God, Jesus answered prayer that through us, now we pass it on. That all of them, that's us as well, may be one, Father, just as we are one, that you are in me and I am in you. May they also be with us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The reason why Jesus wants us to know that we're in him and him in us and we need to be one and together is so that the world believes that God sent him. And then he continues, I have given them glory that you have given me and that they may be one just as we have one. I in them and them in me, so that, there you are again, <laughs> that they may be brought to complete unity, then the world will know that you have sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. So praying, maybe we need to re-evaluate our prayers and as much as it's praying direct to God, and you don't have to get into eloquence and just adding the words so that into it can change our prayer. Let's face it, if Paul did five of these prayers that are written down in the Bible and Jesus did one where he mentioned it twice, maybe we could learn from that and maybe pick up on it. Now I know we've got a lot to learn, a lot to think about because we're just getting out of the head that God's always with us and we don't ask, have to ask him to go with us. We need just to trust. So Ephesians 3 verse 14 is where I'm going. Take a pause, take a drink. Hey up guys, I hope you're doing well on there. But bring up the names. Good to see you. Right. This is verse 14. It says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, this is Paul speaking, from whom every family in heaven and on earth devises its name. It's connecting the people that's gone before and us together now. So it's one family, whether it's parts in heaven, parts on earth. That's why we need to be raptured. So that it can bring those who are in heaven and those who are on earth together. Join us as one body, then we have the fellowship, we have the seven year party in heaven. Interesting that in Jewish terms, Jews never prayed by kneeling down. They always stood, eyes open, and usually had their palms to heaven. Because in the Old Testament, they were beseeching, I love that word, heaven, God. But we don't have to pray like that. Because we can pray sat in the car, uh, in bed, stood up, walking around, in the bath, wherever you want, because he's with us. We don't have to cry up there because we can pray here. And actually, you don't have to always pray out loud, you can pray in your mind. So in the, in the terms of Paul saying, I kneel, it was saying this is a special prayer. And that's where they adopted the idea of we all kneel at the side of the bed and say the prayers. Normal position for a Jewish person was to stand but Paul said that I kneel. Verse 16 says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through the spirit in your innermost beings. So Paul's asking you to be, he's praying that you'll be strengthened, that you receive power. I mean, we all want power, don't we? <laughs> power. We all want to act like Gandalf sometimes. You may not pass. You'll have to look that one up. But we all stand there and want him, you know, we want to be strengthened and we want to be empowered. Why? So that we can operate in the gifts of the Spirit, so that we can witness, so we can walk a foot off the ground, so we can act holy and religious, so that we've got a power and nobody else has. He says that you may be strengthened and have the power 
so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. It's a bit interesting. We want power. Well, Paul's praying that we may have power, doing this power, it were, and be strengthened in us so that Christ may dwell in our hearts. Now, he's not saying that Christ did come into your heart when you were getting saved. No, he's talking about the fact that we have, we are strengthened and empowered so that we realize that Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, is living inside us by his Spirit. And that wherever you go, he goes with you. And wherever you travel, he's there. I mean, have you ever been to a place where they say, oh Lord, just come down into the meeting? And God goes, hey, I'm already here. I'm in here. Pretty cool, eh? Pretty irreverent, but pretty cool. I thought it were good anyway. So we need to have the strength and power according to Paul so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. With Jesus in us, he'll never leave us. And that's why we can grasp stuff like um, Ephesians 1 verse 3 where it says, Praise God who blesses us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Knowing that Christ is with us means he's already blessed us and that we're walking in the blessings. Guys, if you don't believe you're blessed, look at the house you're living in and the area that you're looking at. Because most of the world don't have a house and most of the world don't have three meals a day or four in some cases. 11s and 3 o'clockses and snacks. They don't have those. They just survive on one meal a day with a rainy roof and just try to get by. We are so blessed. But bless me, Lord. I've only got an iPhone 12. Bless me, we are 13. Is there a 13? Yeah, okay, I'm thinking. I'm just working it out. You know, people cry to God, have your riches, Lord, bless us. And he says, look, I've told you I'm going to meet all your needs through my glorious riches. You know, we have a spiritually rich father, but often we act like impoverished children. We've got a God who is amazing and awesome, and yet we come asking for scraps. You see, having Jesus inside us, having the power and the strength to wreck. Guys, I'm not interpreting this for you, I'm trying to read it to you. Interpretation is when you text them and twist it and make it say something. I'm just reading it to you, okay? I'm reading it to you guys. Reading it. But I'm, I kind of throw some stuff in there. I just love reading the Bible. But it says uh, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith gives us the power to overcome temptation. It gives us the power to stand strong. It gives us the power to be bold. It gives the power for us to forgive people, to stay calm in all situations, to walk with confidence, to have peace in our hearts, to stand in faith and to know what to say in those situations where we may not know what to say. All because Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith because Paul said, may you have the power, may be strengthened and have the power to, of the Spirit in your innermost being so that you know Christ is dwelling in you. You know, people say to me, I don't know if God's with me. Have you got saved? I look at you guys. Because <laughs> none of you guys, obviously. But people say, I don't know if God loves me. Have you read the Bible? I feel so lonely. Sometimes I'd rather have Jesus with me. And be very aware of it than some people. Especially those religious people who pray for 20 minutes and I'm just like bored. And they never actually say anything, but they're using phrases, me and Phil were talking about this earlier, about people that pray and say phrases that they've picked up from people, and they've picked them up from people, who've picked them up from people, who pick them up from the Middle Ages, who were all religious rhetoric. And most of it doesn't make sense. I'm challenging, listen to people's prayers and ask this question, what are they saying? Because sometimes they come out with stuff, and you just wonder, where the people? Oh, well, it's like when you hear kids praying. Kids often mimic or copy the parents. And you can tell what the parents pray by what the kids pray. Because the kids are praying stuff they don't know and don't understand. Because that's what the parents say. Lord, I beseech you in the name of Jesus to come and envelop our room. Let your blood be washed upon this building and sanctify us and set us free. And kids are going, I ain't got a clue what that means, but it sounds spiritual, so I'll say it. Instead of saying, God, I thank you that you're here with me. Be with me as I go out and be a witness for you so that people will come to know you. I ain't got that road. I don't know where I come from. Anyway, where are we? Right. Verse 17 says this, And I pray, says Paul, 
You, being rooted and established, so he's making a bit more sense of what he's just said, and maybe rooted in love. Having the power that, sorry, you may, you have, sorry, which is almost as, as if, uh, may have the power together with all the holy people. Why is he saying that? Why is he saying that we need the power together with all the people? That we may grasp how wide, long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Four statements there. Paul understood by the Spirit, or may not have understood, but by the Spirit talks in four dimensions. I don't know if anybody, when you get into science and physics and then into quantum physics, Paul understood four dimensions that we live in way before most of the people ever did. Height, width, depth and time being one of them. That we may grasp, that you may grasp the word is to take hold of, to let it take hold of you, that we may understand, that it may just envelop us, that we grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ and that and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. How can he know something that passes knowledge? It's like trying to say to somebody, well, you know, what's love? Well, when you fall in love, you'll know. And if you've got to explain it, you don't know it. Because can you ever really explain it? And the love of Christ that envelops us and we need to grasp all of this. When you really get to understand the love of God, it surpasses our knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You see, what Paul, through all these prayers, is talking about is Jesus. And that we may know him, walk in him, that we may have a fullness. You see, one of the best prayers of praying for people, and especially praying for your kids, is that they may know the love that God has for them. Yeah, you want them to go to a good school. Yeah, you want them to do this. You want them to get a good job. You want people to come to Jesus. And that's so true. But realistically, if you love people and you love your kids, you pray that God, that God's love may become real to them, that they may understand how much they love. And I think the church does not understand how much they love because if they understood how much they love, they'd often behave a lot differently. And I don't mean between sin and not sinning. I mean towards each other. When you know how much you're loved by Jesus, you don't have to climb over people to get somewhere. You can trust him. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to say, I'm the person. You don't have to take the God-given gifts and say that, I've got it. Because it's not about your God-given gifts. It's about directing people to him. Because when you understand how much God loves you, it's no longer about you. It's about you reflecting Jesus for other people. And it's not about putting people down. It's about living in peace and raising people up. God, God doesn't just love people because he loves people. God loves people because he is love. He is love. It's not like something that like, oh, I love you. No, he is love. He's also light. He's also life. There's a three-point sermon there. Love, light, and life. You see, God is love, and that's why he tells us to love one another. God is life, that's why he tells us to be the light of the world. And God is life, and that's why he says that we are the life of the party. I don't quite say that, but he said you may have life and have it to the full. I did hear this phrase that, you know, Christians go out and paint the town red and then come into church and paint the church beige. Which it shouldn't be that way. Take that whichever way you want to. God's love isn't just what God does, it's who he is. God is love. And when you're immersed in God's love, it's not like trying to put yourself up anymore. You don't kind of care about where you're at because you're immersed in God's love and you're trying to get other people to walk in the goodness of God. And we can't, if we can't comprehend, comprehend the fullness of God's love, all we can do is immerse ourselves in it. And the more you immerse yourself in the love of God, the deeper you go. And I think that's maturity in God. I think walking with God is, is good and witnessing is good and all those other things are good. But you can tell maturity because a mature Christian who's soaking in the love of God is the one that is a Christian that's often operating on allowing the fruit of the Spirit to flow out of them. Because how can we demonstrate to love, love to people if we don't understand that we're loved? Because you can only reflect out what's within you. There's nothing... When it comes to God's love, there's nothing you can do 
to make him love you more and there's nothing that you can do to make him love you less. You see, the moment I realised that God loves that Christian who never does anything, they've got saved, they've got to get to heaven, they live like the devil, and I realised that God loves them as much as he loves me, kind of nagged me initially. That's a Greek word if you want to check it out. Strong's Concordance, 65, 22.4. Backing it up, don't look it up. But it didn't nag to me because I realised that God's love for us and then what knacked me even more, is that Greek word again, is his priority is the non-Christians. Mm. And we make the priority us. And especially those people who can pray like so amazing, intimidate everybody else. And if you're one of those, great for you. I'm not, sorry. But there's people, and especially when people get gifted and they've got talents and it becomes about them instead of becoming about, let me just point you to Jesus. Mm. You see, there's two mistakes that we make in our prayers, two big mistakes. is that our prayers are often too small and our prayers are often too general. We have a, spiritual, a spiritually rich Father in heaven, yet we act like impoverished children. And yet the Bible tells that we are seated in heavenly realms, in our, in our positions. So, you know, we need to pray out of God's ri glorious riches that we are strengthened and that we are empowered to know the love of God. And our prayers sometimes are too general and too small. So we need to reevaluate them and start praying prayers that are faith-built prayers. I'm not going to tell you what to pray or even how to pray, because if you've got faith, two words. When I were at the youth weekend away, they were amazed, because when we were praying for people, I prayed very quickly, three or four sentences at the most, and then moved on. And they were amazed, because it didn't take me 20 minutes to do what they think. And I said, look, we've asked, we're trusting, we're believing. You don't need a 20-minute prayer to get a two-minute job done. So like, you can pray for your kids, and I'll use the kids, pray that God, you know, God, don't let my kids get on drugs. Or you could pray, Lord, don't let my kids get on drugs so that they can be shiny lights in school. You know, instead of saying, Lord, you know, I need my bill paying. Lord, bless me so I can pay my bill. And also so that... I can help somebody else pay their bills. You see, there's a big difference there, isn't there? Suddenly you've gone from meet my needs to a step of faith. So that is a step of faith. Lord, help my marriage to survive. No, Lord, help my marriage to prosper and to flourish so that we become a shining example to other couples that are struggling. You kind of see that, can't you? That step forward, so that. Pray something so that this. Because it takes your focus off you, puts it on somebody else, and actually you're focusing on Jesus at the same time. But if you read through that passage in, um, in Ephesians chapter 3, we come to verse 20. And if there's any verse you should have underlined in your Bible, it's verse 20. And if it isn't, you need to get it. And in fact, get it in the King, New King James Version of the Bible, because I think it's better. Might not be accurate, but I just love the way it says it. So in the NIV it says this. Now, this is Paul ending his prayer, amen. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Talk about prayers that are skinny, limp-wristed. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine according to his power that is in at work with us. The New King James puts it this way, which is what I like. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all, I need net up here and we can get higher. All that we can ask or think according to the power that isn't at work within us. Lord, give me some scraps. It's an insult. Lord, can you, can, can, can you, can you do something? What do you want me to do? Sometimes maybe the reason why we're not seeing God answer our prayers is because we've been so general that he's already done it and he don't even know. And after the prayers that people pray, God's not going to answer them anyway because he's already answered them at the cross. He's like looking good, duh. What do you mean, bless me? What about I mean, go with you? What do you mean, come down? What do you mean about this stuff? That's why I encourage people, read the Bible, read what it says. But he says, 
Now to him who was able to do immensely more than we could ever ask or imagine, and I've got a good imagination, according to the powers that set work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all the generations, that's right down to us, forever and ever, amen. amen. I like that, and I like preaching on it the first time when we did Ephesians, but I love this because it's talking about that he can do it immeasurably more. He holds our atoms together, he spins the universe around, off it goes. He died for us and was risen from the dead. And we come before him and go, can you help God? Uh, yeah. What? What? Now, with respect, me and Phil were talking about this early on. You know, sometimes in your life you need something. And it, I, I was saying to Phil, if I needed a tenor... And I come up to Phil, because I'm a good friend, I've got a good relationship, I say, Phil, can you lend us 20 quid? <laughs> and I know he would. But it'd be an insult, wouldn't it? If I spent 20 minutes before and buttering him up, there's a cup of tea, Phil. Do egg butty? I'll get money out of you later on for it. And I waffle on for 20 minutes about how awesome and amazing he is. How his head shines, how it's great. <laughs> How he looks after his wife. <laughs> Can I borrow 10 quid? <laughs> Lord Jesus, you know my needs and you've promised to meet all my needs. But Lord, I ask that you meet my needs in such an awesome way that I may be a blessing to other people. So that I may be a blessing to other people. Lord, I thank you, you're looking after my kids. And I thank you, Lord, but I also pray that you will just make them aware of your love for them so that they may become mighty warriors for you. You can see how it changes, it raises faith inside you. Now, if it happens once in the Bible, we could still preach about it. But the fact that it happened five times by Paul, and Jesus in one prayer said it twice, I think we need to grasp this and get hold of it. So that we focus more on him and understand his love and his care for us. Amen.